Decoding Jay Shankar comments at the Raisina dialogue. Is India on the defensive or is non alignment back in foreign policy? Hello and welcome to Worldview at the Hindu with me, Sohasini Heather. This is episode 59, where we're going to look at the Raisina dialogue held in New Delhi this week and also ask the question of what India's position there means. Was it just defensive or is it a call for a new non aligned posture for a world in the throes of another great power conflict as it was more than 50 years ago? Now, sparks flew across the Raisina dialogue sessions where a number of European foreign ministers and officials led by European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, she was the, in fact, the chief guest at the inaugural, they all hardened positions on Russia, called on India to reconsider its position on the conflict in Ukraine. Now, during the EU President von der Leyen's speech in particular, and then when foreign ministers came face to face at a town hall event with External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar, many questions were asked. Let's just listen to some of those. Our response to Russia's aggression today will decide the future of both the international system and the global economy. Will heinous devastation win or humanity prevail? Many would say that Russia attacked Ukraine precisely because it's a democracy. How does India, as the world's largest democracy, see its role in defending free societies globally. Can you tell us a little bit the justification of what Russia is doing uh, in uh, Ukraine? Now, understandably, External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar's responses were very sharp. Possibly he's heard many of these questions coming in for the past two months since the conflict began. He himself, remember, had visited Munich and Paris in February and then hosted more than a dozen foreign ministers in Delhi most of them from the Western Alliance against Russia. And of course, on Worldview, we had covered all of those. Um, in his comments, Jay Shankar firstly said India needs no other country's approval. Listen in. We have to be confident about who we are. I, I, I think it's better to engage the world on the basis of who we are rather than try and please the world as a pay limitation of what they are. And then Jay Shankar also invoked Afghanistan and where the West had gone wrong last year. Uh, I remember less than a year ago what happened in Afghanistan, uh, where uh, an entire civil society was thrown under the bus by the world. He then asked where the world was when countries in Asia like China and Pakistan challenged the rules-based order. When, when a rules-based order was uh, under challenge in Asia, the advice we got from Europe is do more trade. At least we're not giving you that advice. So clearly some testy moments there. Now the Russian war in Ukraine, as we said, is more than two months old now. It still shows no signs of letting up or easing. And as we have dealt with in previous episodes of Worldview, India's position has been fairly clear and it's been repeated in Parliament as well. To begin with, India has continued to abstain at all United Nations and multilateral votes that criticize Russia. In fact, abstain from a vote brought about by Russia. It's also refused to join sanctions by more than 30 countries, including the US, EU, uh, even India's Quad partners, Australia, Japan and others. Uh, third, it has increased its intake of Russian oil over the last two months, despite the US ban, despite the European calls to cut Russian imports. Uh, fourth, India has discussed with Russia how to build payment mechanisms that subvert or circumvent the sanctions so as to what it calls stabilizes its economic engagement with Russia. And at the same time, India has also continued to call for diplomacy and dialogue, the need to respect sovereignty and for an immediate end to hostilities. So is this a balancing act? Is this some kind of non-alignment already? Many are really now asking if after eight years in power, the Modi government is re-embracing India's older principles of non-alignment in particular. At a time when the world is becoming more and more divided between the US and Europe on one side and Russia and China on the other. 
Remember the non-aligned movement that came about in 1961 uh, after a conference in Bandung in Indonesia in 1955 that saw five global leaders. It is interesting at that time these were considered five very, very tall leaders um, at the height of the Cold War, the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. Who were the five? There was Prime Minister Nehru, uh, there was President Tito of Yugoslavia, there was President uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, uh, Nkrumah of Ghana and President Sukarno of Indonesia who of course hosted that Bandung conference. Today the non-aligned movement or NAM as it was called has 120 members or two-thirds of the UN. Uh, even so, it does seem like a relic of the past. Uh, so, let us just take a quick look at what are the problems with non-alignment in today's scenario. To begin with, of course, for India, the Modi government has thus far rejected NAM as what it calls a Nehruvian era idea uh, and uses instead terms like strategic autonomy to describe its policies. Also, Prime Minister Modi has not attended a single NAM summit during his tenure. He has become the first full term PM actually to skip uh, those non-alignment summits which are normally meant for heads of state or heads of government. He has sent others in his place. Of course, one of the big reasons for non-alignment being put aside is that in the past few years, India has joined multiple groupings that are built around global powers. The Quad around the United States' strategy and the SCO around Russia uh, and China of course, which really takes it away from the non-aligned principles. Then of course, there are India's problems with Pakistan in particular, which is also a non-aligned member as well as countries like Malaysia and other countries that have been critical of India on human rights violations, on Jammu and Kashmir, uh, the treatment of minorities as well. These have all come up at uh, various fora and India has been uncomfortable with them. And then finally, there is the problem that over the course of all these years, other NAM members like Iran, Cuba, Venezuela remain under heavy sanctions from the West and India's ties with them are no longer as robust as they used to be. So, is there a case to be made for a new non-alignment initiative at all? Take a look at where the situation stands right now. The world is certainly facing challenges from great power conflicts again. In fact, at the Raisina Dialogue, Mr. Jay Shankar specifically referred to Afghanistan, COVID, Ukraine, uh, China's moves in the Indo-Pacific as examples where big power rivalry is having global consequences. The second reason really is that India continues to maintain many of the original NAM principles. What are those? Political self-determination for all, mutual respect for sovereignty, something India continues to speak about, non-aggression, non-interference in internal affairs as well as equality. Now, when you look at the admission of NAM members, you have to remember uh, that the, the, the basis of the membership was that countries must take independent policy decisions away from the great power complex. That's what it was called in the 1950s and the 1960s uh, and not be a member of any defense alliance or to host any foreign military base if it is part of that great power uh, rivalry complex. Now, these are all uh, criteria that India adheres to even today. Many of the NAM members do not, but India does. Uh, also, while more than 120 countries did vote to censure Russia at the UN General Assembly, no more than 40 have actually joined the US and EU sanctions. This really indicates that many countries, not just India, are unwilling to be drawn into the growing battle lines between Russia and the West and China and the West, uh, as well as all the weaponization of uh, the economy, of uh, various multilateral organizations, of energy uh, and other commodities. The fourth reason really is that the members of NAM are mostly from what is called the Global South. This ties in with India's push for a South-South cooperation of developing countries in particular. Uh, but if you take a look at NAM, 53 of the member countries are from Africa, 39 from Asia, 26 from Latin America or South America and the Caribbean and just two from Europe. So, it is very clear that the broad swathe of the non-aligned movement really comes from the global south. 
Uh, and finally, all India's neighbors, including Bhutan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Maldives, uh, Sri Lanka, also of course Pakistan and Afghanistan, are members of the non-aligned movement uh, and, and say that they share that value of independent foreign policy along with India. So it's an important forum by that logic. Clearly, the strong pushback that India has made against all these requests to shift its position on Ukraine is going to be tested again some more this week in particular, as Prime Minister Modi travels to Europe, uh, to Germany, Denmark and France at the beginning of May and then again at the end of the month when he's due to travel to Japan for a quad summit with leaders of the US, Australia uh, and Japan. Later this year, in fact, he will travel to Indonesia for the G20 summit. And this is now already split down the middle. In fact, people are talking about G10 versus G10 uh, over the question of whether to include Russian President Putin at the G20 summit or not. Given all these pressures of today, India could once again essay at least a founding role in a new non-aligned structure that once again takes uh, power away from some of these big powers locked in a rivalry. Now clearly this is a broader question on Indian foreign policy that we are going to continue to hear about uh, in the next few months, particularly as this conflict progresses. Uh, I'll get you some reading recommendations on worldview in the past. I've recommended Non-Alignment 2.0 by a series of scholars including Shiv Shankar Menon uh, and Sham Saran. Also, I, I have spoken about The India Way. This is written by Mr. Jay Shankar himself. Uh, he clearly doesn't advocate non-alignment but speaks much more about strategic autonomy, multipolar alignment and all the rest. Uh, there's also an interesting book called Forged in Crisis, India and the United States since 1947. Now, this is as much about India and the United States as what was going on. Uh, this is a book by Rudra Chaudhary, brilliantly uh, archived really, that looks at the period in which the non-aligned movement was formed. Uh, there's another book uh, which is more international, Non-Aligned Movement Summits, A History. This is by Jovan Kavoski. He's a Serbian, a U former Yugoslavian academic who puts together archives from all the countries that joined the movement. He looks in particular at President Tito's travels to India and Burma, Myanmar uh, and other countries to try and build up support for this. Uh, then there's the Non-Aligned Movement and the Cold War. Delhi, Bandung, Belgrade. This is brought out by Routledge Studies on the Modern History of Asia and is a more academic book, a good collection of essays. Uh, and then there's India's Foreign Policy Dilemma over Non-Alignment. This is by Sudhanshu Tripathi. Uh, it's a more recent look really at the sustainability problem of non-alignment. And finally, two books on Indian foreign policy by US-based Indian academics. I may have spoken about these in the past in another context, but one is certainly Making India Great, The Promise of a Reluctant Power by Aparna Pandey, who devotes one chapter really to India's geopolitical strategy. And there's also Indian foreign policy. Uh, this is part of a series of Oxford, uh, uh, Oxford's short introductions. This is by Professor Sumit Ganguly. We certainly hope you enjoy reading all of these and thinking a little bit more about India's foreign policy and where it should be, where it could be. That's all we have time for here on Worldview from the team. Thanks for watching.